Welcome everybody to another episode of the AI Sales Revolution podcast, a podcast where we interview sales leaders to understand how they're using AI to share best practices and help everyone to prepare for what is to come. I'm Bowen, the CEO of Wonderway, and today I'm lucky to have the brilliant Jenny, Jeremy Donovan with me. Uh, so Jeremy is now working as the EVP of RevOps and Strategy to Insight Partners, where he's working with their portfolio companies to help them grow faster. Um, now, the, I came across Jeremy because um, I follow his, his posts on LinkedIn and I know he's super research focused. And he's already actually told me that he's somewhat of a skeptic of AI and sales. So I particularly asked, wanted to bring him on the show to bring a more balanced view of the state of AI and sales um, to the listeners of the podcast. And um, yeah, I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to really understand what he's been looking into and maybe spar with him a bit on on the real state of AI. Um, so yeah, great to have you on the show, Jeremy. Yeah, Would you, thank, uh, thanks, so, thanks so much. And yeah, happy to, happy to chat about what I'm hearing out there from our portfolio companies, what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking about. So yeah, absolutely excited to dive in. Great. So just before we, we, we dive into the meat, um, Maybe if you could um, tell me a bit about yourself. So I'd love to hear a bit about your story, sort of the background on on how you, what you're doing before this, and how you ended up at um, at, at Insight Partners. Yeah, the 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 fastest version, I suppose, is I started life out as a semiconductor engineer, and the uh, that data and analytics and programming part of me has always been a part of every job I've ever done. Eventually. My career wound its way from semiconductor engineering to revenue strategy and operations, which I've been geeking out on for the latter latter half of my career here. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the 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 long and the skinny of it. Prior to this job, I was at a, uh, one of our portfolio companies, Salesloft, for four years, and then got the chance to move over here when Salesloft was acquired. And it, it's a cool job because things like you know the AI that we're going to talk about today. Um, I get I, I get to look at hundreds of portfolio companies and see what what they're doing. Um, get challenged every day with something new that could be a new technology, could be a new business process, right? Could be a, a new growth lever for companies. So yeah, it's it's uh, every it's I, I thought two years into this job, it would be repetition, but it is far from repetition. Okay, super interesting. Um, well, yeah, let's dive right in. So, um, you know, I think as as you just pointed out, one of the most exciting things about your role is you're able to look at across um, a whole portfolio. Insight Partners has got a gigantic portfolio of companies, so you've got this kind of bird's eye view of what's trending across across some of the, the you know fastest growing tech companies in the world. Um, so, I'd just be curious, like when it comes to to AI, and I'd like to focus the conversation more around generative AI and sort of the changes we've seen over the last twelve months. Um, what are the main things you've looked into? Um, what, what are the main things you've looked into and that you're talking about with your with your portfolio companies? What yeah, are some for, of the, the trends sure. you're seeing? And, and I'll start with a qualifier. I mean, I think you appropriately did frame me as an AI skeptic. I think I, I am a relative skeptic. I, I'm, I'm also, you know, old enough to have seen a lot of foolish tech predictions in my life or even in it pr- prior to the time I was born, right? I mean, I think the most famous one is... is uh, Longtime IBM president Thomas Watson, who said, "I think there's a world market for maybe five computers." Right. So, w- with with that in mind, that one could be horrifically <laughs> wrong. Um, uh, I'll, I'll answer your question. So, I mean, first of all, as a as a you know as an organization, we're obviously quite pro AI. Um, you know, no no doubt that I'll separate Gen AI and we can call it predictive AI. Um, you know, ha- can have a especially predictive AI is already having a huge impact on 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 business and parts of Gen AI too. And we'll talk about some of those use cases. Um, with respect to Gen AI specifically, uh, it's twofold really, right? So we have over 500 portfolio companies. They're all, in, they're all software, almost all enterprise software. So we're absolutely encouraging our portfolio companies where it's relevant to integrate AI features and functionality, Gen AI features and functionality into their into their solutions, I, I think that's that's a no-brainer. Um, you know, whether you're skeptical or not about the near-term value, the long-term value is is almost. Yeah, I'm never gonna because I come from a science background. Like, I'm not gonna say certain, but I think you can say with pretty strong certainty that like the medium to long-term value is very high. My skepticism is more like short-term in sales. So then, okay. the, yeah, the second bit is besides advising them, you know, to to develop on, on the R and D side faster. 
we we also want them to find ways to become more productive right it's it's no secret that the venture world has shifted from you know no one used to call it growth at all costs but aggressive growth into efficient growth and and if ai can bring efficiencies and gen ai can bring efficiencies and so be it so uh if i double click on that right i, I think you have to deconstruct the jobs to be done within a within a company a, across each of the functions right so i I, I don't have deep expertise, say, on the engineering side, so I couldn't comment like on the GitLab Copilot, which may or may not. I mean, I do code, but I'm not a I, I hack. I don't I don't code professionally. So like, is it useful for code snippets and things like that? Like, yeah, heck yeah, I find it useful for that, and I presume it's quite useful on the engineering uh, side, especially for people. I think I think I read that people who are super adept programmers it's not going to necessarily make their them better but for the you know average and below average programmer it's going to make them better and, and certainly it's going to help you learn fast so now let's go to the go to market side and i'm going to split marketing from sales so on the marketing side i think the value is already there um I, I don't and i don't think i'm being i think i'm being very derivative in saying that even a personal use case is uh, I did a survey recently of our portfolio companies where I was trying to separate out practice, go to market practice from best practice, right? Because there's so many tips and that all the all the talking heads give on how to do things better and more productively, but there's just so many of them. How do you prioritize which ones actually have business impact? So, uh, you know, uh, since we know the performance of our portfolio companies, we're able to ask them to what extent they're following certain practices. So I write up this, this basically, you know, report with lots of data in it. And I go to our marketing team and I say, hey, like, I'd love to get this out to our portfolio companies or out in the broader public. You know, can you help? And they said, sure. Can you just write an outline for that? So they were able to take my outline and this PDF feed it into chat GPT and say, write a thousand word blog post. They fed me back that blog post just straight out of chat GPT of the thousand words. Maybe I changed five. Right. And I was like, wow, that is hours and hours saved. Right. So that, that's a, that's a pretty typical, I think, content marketing use case. So absolutely transformational in, in that respect. Um, so I'll I'll pause there before I get to sales. Any thoughts, comments? No, no, hundred percent. I mean, I've, yeah, I've done the same thing with my blog articles, and I think many, yeah, many exactly. people listening here, here as well. I mean, yeah. I, I go to the days of sweating over you know words like wordsmithing articles, and you know when I would always write them on the weekends and and like late at night, and usually my brain wasn't working very well, and I'd be rewriting the same sentence over and over again, and then eventually just like ah, it's a blog article, you know, eighty percent is good enough, but now it's just like you know it's instant. It, it's, um, it's, and, I, it's, and the better input you give it, right? Like the fact that I gave it both an original PDF as well as an outline, that combination was pretty killer. I think if I had just given it an outline and I didn't have data, uh, I don't know how, I mean, it would have been better than just write me a thousand word article on best practices and go to market. Because that's what I was trying to avoid is, is I don't just want the synthesis, you know, Gen AI is the synthesis of a corpus of text. And I just, I don't just want the synthesis. I want to know the reality, right? Like hallucination is not okay. And, and there's not a huge hallucination problem necessarily for things that are covered well, but a lot of people are pontificating on go-to-market best practices and not all of them are like really needle moving. Uh, a lot of them are serving, you know, an agenda of one kind or another. So, yeah, so moving on to the sales side, again, I think you can deconstruct even further, I, I deconstruct even further the jobs to be done, right? And you can talk about top of the funnel prospecting, you can talk about mid funnel stuff, opportunity management, you can talk about post sale, customer success, implementation, renewals, what have you, right? So what, I, you know, what I'm observing is the following, absolutely everybody is, is accelerating the use of Gen AI for top of the funnel prospecting. And here's my concern is, um, you know, having looked at this stuff for ages, as soon as 
something novel comes along. Like years ago, uh, it was really novel to put your a person's first name in the subject line of an email. And when that, when that, and now like you're smiling now, but when that first came about, that was going to drive much higher response rates because it showed that a human took the time to type your name into the subject line of an email. It showed human effort. And of course, we all destroy, you know, we all the, the sort of tech ecosystem, my, 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 you know, myself included, uh, sales tech ecosystem destroyed it because we turned that into a dynamic tag. And then you could just drop someone's first name in there and poof, it goes away. Right. Um, and then, and then we got more, we've been getting more and more sophisticated. And now we're at the point, right, where you could feed in someone's LinkedIn profile, you could feed in their 10K, whatever. And, and, but what you what you get on the, on the recipient side is cookie cutter stuff. And even though the personalization is objectively better and getting better every single day, when you, and even if a human couldn't otherwise detect human effort, now the detection of of genuineness of authenticity is is like difference effortful difference and if ever if you if every email you get is kind of citing the same factoids then it, it again they just delete 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 um you know spam filters may or may not catch that but it's delete 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 mm -hmm. so that's my that's really my issue is like AI, Gen AI has given us the ability to send a lot more emails faster and even arguably better, more personalized emails faster. But the consequence, though, of all these emails is a lower and lower response rate. I, I don't exactly know what the cold, truly cold email response rate is. I'll read sometimes people on LinkedIn will talk about response rates that I know are not true. I know as of like five years ago, even the, the best truly cold outbound response rates to emails was maybe two to 3%, probably skewing towards two. And that was, you know, four or five years ago. My guess is that true cold outbound email response rates are sub 1% at this point and, you know, and only getting worse. So yeah, that's my, like my skepticism is, is around, um, you know, on the on the email side, my skepticism is is just around. I don't think that this is going to actually improve results, and if anything, it pushes um, some flight to a different sort of connection. And that mm -hmm. connection, what I'm seeing in, in our portfolio for sure, is like uh, not. You know, if someone has great inbound go for it right but but where they were trying to do a lot of outbound prospecting via sdrs if they're taking a look and if that if they have good lifetime value to cac ltv to cac uh to customer acquisition cost if they have good ltv to cac on the on on the motion great keep going right like pour the gas on but in many instances the ltv to cac on the outbound sdr motion certainly is is not great overall they're looking at that by segment whether that's SMB, mid-market, enterprise, different geographies, whatever, like really going through with a fine-tooth comb and and in many instances cutting back there. And then they're taking those dollars and they're shifting the dollars over to uh, either developing a partner channel or investing more in a partner channel that they already have. Not everyone has that ability. So when they're not doing that, they're investing it in inbound, um, you know, like other other fruitful inbound or um, more owned events as well. Like I, I, I'm not seeing necessarily a ton more of like, uh, you know, big, the sort of big, big event spend, booth spend. But if you can run your own curated, effortful, authentic, genuine events, right, then, then that's working. So I, I went on my little tirade there, but that's, that. And that's that for that job to be done. I think that's the thing that's super interesting as well. To hear your perspective, having come from sales loft. I mean, also a, a tool that is you know leading the market in the email outreach. Um, you know, I think you you paint a bit of a bleak picture. Um, I think it almost it almost sounds kind of like a race to the bottom there for the for the the, the outbounding, um, like the outbound they call the email outbounding space. I mean, it, people are automating things more and more. 
and everyone's trying to get ahead to make things more efficient but the overall industry is kind of the result is that it's almost killing the, the killing the space so i think it is an interesting situation that a lot of these um you know outbounding tools probably have outbound email tools is that they might release a new feature with more personalization it gives them a quick bump but in the longer term maybe they're actually killing their killing their, yeah. their market which i think I, is I will, a funny like innovators yeah. dilemma or, or uh I'll, I'll, I'll say to, you know, the co-founders of SalesLoft, Kyle Porter and Rob Foreman's credit, we had countless conversations about times where users would request a feature. And usually, right, if lots of users are all requesting the same feature, that, that goes to the top of the list, right? So, for instance, being able to automate an email uh, in, a, in a cadence or sequence, we had a lot of debate about whether we wanted to do that because we were very, very worried that people would send like disingenuous emails, uh, wouldn't put the thought into personalizing the content. So ultimately, we you know we yielded to the customer demand, but that was that was not a an a, a, a thing that we were particularly happy about doing. And there were other instances, yeah, of, of features like that where, um, you know, we really we really tried to put a stake in the ground and educate via customer success or other content that we were putting out there to say, like, hey, um, yes, you can do these things, but you should not do these things. And obviously, a lot of effort into throttling, you know, emails that could be sent out for deliverability purposes and so on. A lot of effort into research of the impact of pers true personalization on um you know on reply on positive reply rates and things like that so so yeah it's uh it's it is definitely a challenge for that that industry right now and and i i, I think people are slowing down a little bit right it's it's to be more thoughtful more effortful and it's to do again it's i, I think the key and i saw it right like the key is to do things that computers are not novel things that computers are, are not able to do so like th there's there are fewer of those things but i think a, a good example of that still are things like watching somebody's um you know like listening to their podcast watching them on a webinar watching them in some appearance that they that they have and and citing very specific things about you know about that and yes ai will get there on that too and and maybe borderline there on that too but not totally yet um yeah no. yeah so oh, I, I think that there's ways I, I agree i mean i think you made a great point about the um the quality is objectively better on the emails but the skepticism is so much higher i mean i was it's different use case but i was in a negotiation with a a customer the other day um it was, you know a difficult conversation and 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 we've we've been emailing back and forth quite a bit throughout this sales cycle and then as soon as we switched to negotiation suddenly i started getting these very long emails with these very very wordy these very wordy long emails and it was obvious that he had just switched over and started putting things into chat gpt because it didn't sound like him anymore and and um, just small things but like you know using more complicated words and signing off the email warm regards whereas before he was saying cheers and just like small stuff that but it immediately kind of then i'm he's writing to me like this and then i start using chat too too and then it feels like we're we you know our whole i, I stopped using it because i thought it was a bit embarrassing at some point but you can you can right. often tell you can often tell that it you know especially if you know the person that it's not their their tone of voice and that it's a different use of words and i think that's it's you know, it felt a bit disingenuous because we'd built a relationship throughout the sales cycle. And then suddenly it felt like I was talking to a computer, not, not him. Um, yeah, we yeah. Did a, we did a, it reminds me, we did a study at sales loft. Cause again, we had access to hundreds of millions, if not billions of interactions. And one of the interesting studies was emails that have one or two mistakes in them actually have higher positive response rates than ones that don't. And it's just, I think it's the same thing with speaking is I've, I've watched a few of the uh, there's a name for it, but basically synthetic humans, right? They're they're talking, they're you're just given a script basically, and you, now you have this realistic looking human talking to you and making hand gestures and and whatever else, and they can speak every language, but there's there's a flatness still to it. But I, again, that'll that's I can't imagine we're more than six months to a year from the point where those things 
are very authentic. It's weird when an AI uses ums and ahs and likes filler words, but sneaking a couple in there every once in a while and and having a bit of a personality, I, I, I don't. We're, we're clearly not far from from that that stage. But maybe let's um. So I, I know you know at the beginning of the podcast I introduced you as a skeptic. So I know that you've looked into a lot of different areas and and you said that you're skeptical, maybe more in the short term rather than than, than the longer term. But is there anything that you you are particularly excited about or anything that you are like recommending to your portfolio companies. Um, Maybe, you know, is there anything you said that in the short, you know, you saw it in marketing, but in sales, is there anything that you're particularly excited about? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll split things. So, I mean, yes, to the extent that it can accelerate first drafts in prospecting, go for it. Why, you know, why not? To the extent that you can tighten up because fewer words is often better than more words go for it so we're, we're certainly recommending for them to for them to do that um we're starting to you know i think that uh, we're going to get there but i'm starting to see in the middle of the funnel right of of ai that you can kind of ask it to coach you a bit on where you are on a deal that i think is interesting i mean i don't know what the return is yet and how effective that stuff is but it seems like a, you know an interesting use case that's probably combines Gen AI and predictive AI to assess deal health and 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 so forth and and what you know what criteria maybe is missing from whatever qualification methodology you're using medic or what have you. So I, I think that's interesting. The other one I think and what got me interested to say like hey yeah let's do this podcast is I was listening to. A uh, replay of I think it was Mark Roberge uh, at Saster this this past Saster, and he was talking about the application of of AI and where that might work. And he had a what struck me as a pretty original thought was his thought was in areas where there's an incumbents, um, you know, it's going to be really hard for new companies to get traction because because the incumbents have data. And and that data gives them a bit of a moat to develop more and better, faster, large language models around what they're doing. And he and he was thinking out loud about what areas didn't have a good data moat. And you know, certainly in, in the domain you're in, I think is is the one the one he cited, which is coaching. That that reps don't get right. They systematically, when you look at all the surveys, don't get the Man- coaching by their managers that that they would value and um and the the conversation intelligence tools that are out there have plenty of rep calls with prospects but they don't really have much in the way of coaching conversations between reps and their managers right so they're like is no data moat there so that to me is I agree with Mark Roberge's perception that there's an opportunity there. I don't, you know, I don't know the state of the, of the tools market there. My qualifier is the following. And I think this is an, and not an, or, which is like the current state is basically garbage in terms of coaching, right? It's like, there's not a lot out there uh, of, of, managers coaching their reps right like you're starting from a very poor starting point so i I think ai uh uh, you know i feel like gen ai can can do a good v1 job of it where i would love to see ai get to is to have a a longitudinal understanding of the rep right so imagine i'm a sales rep this thing is is not just looking at my one call but is looking at all the calls i've done and seeing how I've progressed and what skill gaps, you know, I might still have, what are the most important skill gaps? And then the other contextual understanding is not just of me, but it's also of my company's sales process. It's also of my company's product, of my company's value-based messaging, you know, like whatever. Uh, so that, and, and what I'm getting at here is that I don't know that Gen AI is at the point where it's, as where it, it's caught up to the human when they do coach that it's caught up to the human in terms of that contextual understanding. But I, I think, I mean, 
I would be naive to say that we won't get there also. And who knows if, the, if it's really hard to predict anything other than tomorrow uh, and tomorrow is hard enough to predict, but it, it, it seems things seem to be going so fast and this seems to be a, a very solvable type of a type of a problem. Um, the other thing I, that's on my mind about this is, and this is why I say it's an and not an or is I, I, I would love to see a study of how, uh, of the ultimate behavior change when you get coached by a machine versus a human. So what I'm getting at, right, is, is Bowen, if you're my boss and you give me feedback on a call, I might, I, I suspect I would be much more likely to act. And I'm going to act for two, like for a couple of reasons. One, because you're my boss and, you know, there's like that, that, that power dynamic. But two is, is reciprocity, right? And uh, I'm grateful that you as my, as my manager took the time as a fellow human being to coach me and give me advice. And um, as a result, this triggers me to be more likely to, you know, to change. That's a, a hypothesis, but I suspect, so, so I think it's an and, right? Is if what you're getting is nothing right now, great. Like, give me some, give me some AI coaching for sure. But I, I, I think it's an and. I want to know maybe, some other human cares. Maybe I can jump in there. I mean, I can tell you what we're seeing. So, um, uh, so we, we do AI based coaching. Um, and I think when we look at the way that sales reps are using it, some people will pick up that coaching and they'll run with it. But I'd say they're the minority, to be honest. I think the minority will, when they first start using the tool, they they maybe they do a few things at the beginning, but it kind of wears off over time. Um, and then where we see what we see the value for most people is um, is it is when the manager's coming in. Um, but I think what we do here, what we tell our customers is we don't replace the need for AI for manager coaching, but we do save them the time that it takes them to listen to calls. So um, you can imagine right now, if a manager was going to coach a sales rep, maybe they need to sit down and listen to three or four calls to figure out what the gaps were for the sales rep before they even walk into that coaching conversation. So that turns a one hour coaching conversation into you know five hours of prep or something. And what our objective here is that we listen to the calls for them so we can save them that time and we de develop kind of a, a, a coaching report for the manager that they can come in um, have that conversation and then they're collecting enough data across enough calls that we can then make that conversation more objective and be able to see how things are tracking. Because I think that's the other thing that's missing. If you're a manager and you identify a weak point for a rep and um, you know you have a coaching conversation, you, you coach them on that point in two weeks time, how do you know if they've actually improved or not? Then you have to listen to three or four calls again. But are those three or four calls that you listen to, are they representative? Are they um, like I think it's actually quite hard to judge whether people are improving. It's a very subjective thing, and I think yeah. you can bring bring more bring more objectivity yeah, I, to that. So I, I love the uh, point about me measuring the improvement. That's or that's really clever. The other thing I was thinking about as you were saying that is, let's say you manage eight, six, seven, eight reps. It can be really hard to remember what you're coaching, you know, the rep 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 number four on. So to be, you know, to have something that cues you that says, hey, you're coaching them on setting up front contracts more, more effectively. And, and then, yeah, to your point, it identified that upfront contracts was the highest yield thing to coach them on and then measured whether or not they had made progress on that over time that I would think would be, yeah, quite valuable. And then I like your point about manager augmentation that, um, you know, they want, they want their manager to think highly of them, but they it's selfish and selfless, right? Like they want their manager to think highly of them. They also want to improve objectively. So to be able to see that, I think is quite valuable. I think, I think another thing we see with managers, you, you talked about this point about the thing that like upfront contracts being the thing they should work on. That's something I think a lot of managers struggle to do is to pick that one thing. Like the way that conversation intelligence tools are built now is that you comment Time stamp the long call. So what a lot of people do is they'll listen to a call and they'll they'll nitpick on details and there could be fifteen points that they put on the call and then that feedback is completely overwhelming for the salesperson when they get this stream of consciousness throughout their call and then it's like okay I need to change ten different things where do I start here but I think that's also a big part is like okay yes there's room for improvement in a lot of places but if you had to choose one thing to focus on and let's do that for the next two or three weeks. 
then let's make sure that's consistent until we see things moving, you know, getting into a, a good place and let's choose the next topic yeah. and stick with that for a while. So I think there's a lot of here about, um, you know, coaching the managers. I think a lot of managers don't necessarily have the skills or haven't been, you know, they don't, they, you don't get trained on this. So I think helping them as well to prioritize things rather than nitpicking on smaller details. What is that one thing um, that they should be spending on with each person and keeping track yeah. of that over time? And I, um, I've definitely observed with sales managers that, so, you know, they right. They were top reps who got promoted, and their manager coached them on something. And then when I look at sales organizations, I'll see every manager coaching on the exact same thing to everybody because that was that's like the one, one or two or three whatever plays that they know of. So I, I think that's something obviously that computers can do a lot better than humans, which is to there's 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 just more, more than the two or three things like if it were even in deal deal inspection, right? So AI gen AI based deal inspection, which is starting to be a thing. Um, you know, it, a human is going to, a human manager is probably going to just always go to whatever, like uh, decision criteria and champion, because those are often the two, two big things, but it may be on a deal that, uh, that, there's a huge competitive element to it. And they're not diving deep enough on that, or it may be on that particular deal. They haven't established compelling enough. I'm using medic. So, you know, metrics for what the return should be. So that I think the human is, I've seen it like the humans miss elements because they're just conditioned by what they've seen. What about something I'd like to ask you? I'm not sure if you have a read on this, but, um, you talked about the the big players. Um, the big players don't have the data, and they're, they're not really doing much here, right? Like I think conversation intelligence tools. Um, everyone's recording their calls now. Um, they kind of position many of them position themselves as coaching tools, but I don't think that's what people actually use them for. They use them as call recorders and to go back and search for keywords for other things, you know, whatever. But I'm I'm somewhat surprised that the big players haven't taken a stronger step here in the last in the last year. Like, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on why, you know, why do you think it is that, um, you know, the, the gongs and choruses of the world are not, are not, are not pushing harder into this space. Um, you know, I, I know you said you're skeptical about some things about longitudinal and yeah, things like that, yeah. but I think, I think we can already make some big improvements now. And I think the, 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 the potential is massive as the models improve over time. But, you know, in your opinion, why do you think the big players are, or are they? Maybe they are, and I'm not aware of it. But, but what's your read on? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I don't think they're they're there. I think the reason I have to I have to dance around specific company names, but I'll I'll talk like okay. euphemistically yeah. about this. So, um, I think the reason they're not there is simply because of of well, twofold. One is. Early on in the days of conversation intelligence, the message was about coaching. And the, interestingly, the users and buyers didn't end up really using it for that purpose. So the use case shifted, right? And it became much more about, I'm a rep and I don't have to take notes during physical notes during the call because I've got the backup. And if I'm, in a, if I'm a manager and I need to review something, because, let's say I'm going to go you know, my rep's going to bring me into the next meeting and I need to prep, I can watch the call. So I think that like that kind of use case or enablement or product management, right? Ditto, ditto, ditto on all, on all that stuff. But what didn't happen is is the thing you were describing earlier, which is no no one was actively going in and and even times, you know, to the comment about, about, about like the linear timestamp commenting, that would be a, a pleasant thing if people actually did it, but they don't. They're just not coaching each. They're not coaching each other. The managers are not coaching the reps. So I, I think the use case evolved. So that's one thing is like there's just not a strong enough signal for, of, of demand to use these tools for coaching. So that just when they look at their punch list of all the things that they need to do, even in conversation intelligence, there there are more important things for them to you know to, to go after. For instance adding gen ai to the tool so that you can interrogate the call and or get summaries and whatever else so i think mm -hmm. that's thing one but thing two is that that all these companies are um are are need to 
integrate a bunch of other solutions, right? So you kind of see the conversation intelligence world colliding with the data and information, you know, world colliding with the sales engagement world, colliding with the uh, revenue intelligence analytics world, like all these companies need all these pieces now and they don't have unlimited budget. So be, because they have strong, strong enough conversation intelligence to meet the needs of the, you know, of, of their buyers, they're prioritizing their investment in what they're missing, right? If they're missing the analytics piece, they're spending there. If they're missing the sales engagement piece, they're spending there. So I, I think it's a, it's a capital allocation um, and prioritization issue more than anything, more than anything else. Like, is there objective value in getting better at improving the, the ability to use these tools for coaching? Absolutely. Do they think they can get a, a more return on invested capital by doing that versus the other things that I don't think they do? I think that's the reason. I think it's an economic decision. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, I agree with that, especially for the size of the companies. I guess they need to be looking at things that are going to move the needle. And in, in terms of, you know, if you've got a if you got a five billion dollar valuation, you need to work out how you can yeah. move the needle on five billion dollars. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, for uh, sure, yeah. But, uh, but maybe that, that leads us to the next question. Do you think that, I mean, in your opinion, do you think coaching is high enough leverage space that, that it would justify, um, you know, do you think it's being overlooked or um, do you think it's being overlooked right now by companies and it is it is a high enough leverage um, part of, of sales, um, sale, like is sales coaching high enough leverage that it will become more important or, or do you think that there are just bigger fish to fry here? You know? Um, I think it's, I actually, I think it's, well, I've always thought it was important, but I once had, I once worked for a boss and, um, we were talking about budgeting for sales, uh, enablement. And he, he, he explained, he, he basically said to me, there are some CROs who believe in sales enablement formally as a function and some who don't. And he said, I am one of those who believes in it and we're going to budget for it. And, you know, in this particular way. So I do think there are different philosophies about it. So I'll, I'd like, Disclosing my bias is, you know, I believe in in the value of of sales enablement as a driver of sales productivity. So why I think it's more important, it's become more important, right? Is getting back to that whole thing about growth at all costs or aggressive growth versus uh, efficient growth. In an efficient growth world, well, sorry, in an aggressive growth world, if your reps took longer to to ramp, you just hire more reps, right? In oh. in in uh, in a uh, in an efficient growth world, you can't afford to do that. And you need to get your reps ramped faster. You need to get your, you know, average performing reps to perform better uh, as well. And like, there's little other way to do that than by coaching them. And, and that coaching is not just sales skills, right? That coach, that coaching is product knowledge, that coaching is market knowledge, that coaching is the ability to tie features and functionality to value, like whatever it is. So, so yeah, I, I think if anything, the efficient growth world puts an exclamation mark on the value of, on the value of coaching. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then maybe the last question, which is uh, before we finish, and it's a somewhat of a selfish question. Uh, hopefully the, the listeners enjoy it as much as I do, but if you, if you were me, the CEO of a, an AI sales coaching startup, and what would you what would you be doing to to raise the awareness around the importance of this in in this as well? You know, you, you mentioned that a lot of companies are probably looking more at like investing in parts of the stack, like you know, more more headline topics like analytics. Um, maybe they already think they've got a conversation intelligence tools that have coaching covered, but in reality, as we just discussed, I don't think they do. How would you go about kind of educating people on this and maybe maybe raising awareness? Because I think that, to be honest, that is a challenge that we have. Is a lot of people we speak to. Like, oh, we already have a conversation until it's still we're good for coaching. Um, and then, you know, once we get on a discovery call and we start digging into how many calls are actually being coached on um, and getting them to look at the numbers inside their tools and they realize that it's it's not happening. Um, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Like if you were me and you believe in this as a, as a high leverage space, um, but maybe one that's overlooked by people, like how would you how would you raise awareness there and, and, and you know, get people to confront yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Um... I think with AI, I'm going to give you a broad answer. I'll get narrow. So like, I think with AI, I'll be happy when we evolve past the fact that like AI is front and center of what it is in the same way that we don't 
you know, we don't, eventually we don't talk about the technology that, that something uses like cloud. Nobody calls themselves a cloud company anymore because everything's cloud, right? So I think AI is, is like, needs to become an, an underlying thing. So to that, to that end, you know, in, in if I were in your role, um, it's, it's, you got to tie to, uh, there's an emotional component and a rational component to it. Um, on the emotional component side, it is tying to things like great corporate culture, uh, high employee retention, which is, you know, part emotion, part logic. But I think, yeah, if you can, if you can kind of get at the, the benefit of coaching, um, in general. So I do think you have to do, there's this evangelist mission around coaching because it's something that has been under evangelized in general. And then on the, on the rational side, yeah, I think you got to tie to, to like real case studies on faster ramp or real case studies on increased rep productivity, like those things. Cause you're speaking, especially right now, right? You're not just speaking to the head of sales, enablement you're not just speaking to the cro but probably to sell anything right now you're talking to the cfo and the only way the cfo is going to sign off is like if this is accretive to you know to the company quickly and to the extent that that could, you you know you can cut ramp time and or and and i think even more importantly arguably is to increase in a measurable way sales productivity like yeah to me that's that's the thing and then, yeah, the other thing is more tactical. I'm a big, I, I've become a big fan of, a, of a, just discovered it. Of, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I just discovered the Chris Walker Revenue Vitals podcast. He's more of a marketing person, but he does talk about the importance of, especially for earlier stage companies, like the, the importance of the evangelist role. So what you're doing right now is is part of what I would do. I would, I would have a, a, a podcast out there you know, try, try your best to have great content and, and interesting guests. Uh, people be the judge of whether I, uh, I helped in any, or, or hurt you in that respect, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but, and then, yeah, getting, and not just, you know, look what he does, right? Like he's not just, he does his own podcast, but he's also out there like on everybody else's podcast to get the word out really, really you know, people look back at, at, you mentioned Gong earlier for, as the exemplar of content marketing, because there was, and there's different ways to do it, you know, HubSpot way back when also, and maybe they're still great, I don't know, but they were like exceptionally great in the early days. Um, and because they were doing something different and super high value and, you know, ditto with, with Gong was great for a long time. They got kind of shaky for, uh, it felt like, I don't know, six months to a year. And I, and I was just commenting to one of my friends earlier today that I think they're back. Like the, the content marketing is, is, is good once again and data driven and so forth. So yeah, whatever the angle, you know, like whatever the angle is, I, I think that, that evangelism piece is, is critical. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that also goes back to what you were saying um, with it, it's so much easier to put out content now, um, like blog articles and things like that. I think also, you know, building the founder led brand in, in, a, in a market like this where you know it's a, it's a person and it's not an ai generated blog article i think this is yeah, um, yeah. even more important it, than it, and and and, and yeah, that, that's really. been really that's been really bothering me like um what ai does to content right because it just it 10 x is the quantity and you could argue it can improve aspects of the quality and I was trying to ask myself in what other places is there basically like infinite content or infinite, whatever. And I started thinking about the music business. Right. And like I was in Nashville recently and every bar you walk past or go to has incredible music, incredible music. I'm not even a music person, but I, you know, I think I could recognize decent, if not good music when I hear it. And, and, and yet, right. I don't know. I drove past metal and stadium and the Rolling Stones are still touring after decades and decades. And Taylor Swift was, you know, there recently and, and whatever, like Beyonce, whoever there, 
even in a world of infinite content, good content, there's space for great content. And I think that's that that to me is the key is like how do you how do you be great? And and I, I mean you see examples of great Gong with their data driven stuff was great. Um, uh, there's a company I worked for for a period of time just shortly called CB Insights that the the founder and CEO Anand Sanwal writes a newsletter. And I don't know how many subscribers that thing has, probably, I don't know, probably in the millions. And a newsletter, right? Like, a, that's it's nuts, but that newsletter is is humongous demand generation for them. But what's awesome about it is the content is really unique and well re and effortfully researched. And he has a voice, right? Like his voice is in that newsletter. It's not, it's not corporate. Um, it, it is, it's him. And he has a little bit of snark factor to him, snarkiness. And, but that's human, right? And his humanity comes through. So I, I again, like, I think that's the key is, is like the personality. A lot of people sing. I don't. I mean, I'm, I don't. A lot of people can sing really, really, really well. They can play the guitar really, really, really well. Whatever. Like there are plenty of people. But like, why is it that, you know, the Rolling Stones and Beyonce and Taylor Swift and whatever break free? It's not mm -hmm. just right. It's like there's a personality factor. Mm -hmm. I think that that is part of that. Uh, is part of what makes the difference. So, okay, um, we're, we're a bit over time. I started by saying that I didn't think we'd make it to 30 minutes and we're well over that. So, uh, so good job. <laughs> Must have been an interesting conversation. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining the show. Um, for anyone that was listening and they want to, to get in touch or, you know, um, get in touch with you or, or unpack some of the thoughts we had here today, what's the best way, way to reach you? Yeah, probably what everyone says, uh, LinkedIn, that, that's, I'm hyper responsive on there. So yeah, just uh, just shoot me a note if I can be of service. Awesome. Well, thanks for jumping on the call and and yeah, great to have someone with a bit of a different perspective and, and also thank you for taking the time to dive into the coaching space because of course that's what I'm interested in and what probably most of the people listening to the show are too. Um, so great to have you and um, yeah, see you soon. Great. Thanks, Bob.